So fertilization control. Well, there's different ways of when you're growing, and a very traditional way is to make sure that all your fertilizer is in your uh, soil, for example. And a lot of people will then top up as the season goes, or as the growing period goes. But you've got potting compost, which can be made of peat, or it can be made of uh, a mixture of uh, materials. They can come as pre-fertilized, where it only has a small amount of fertilization just to get you started, just to act as a buffer so the plant doesn't go about, but you need to keep topping this up as the plant grows, um, and well, when you water. But then you've also got fertilized stocks. Now, you could consider this could be uh, compost that you buy where they've got fertilization in there that lasts for three weeks, four weeks, or five weeks, then you need to supplement later on. But you've also got soils. Uh, many of us work with uh, building up the nu nutrition in our soil, analyzing the soil to make sure we've got um, the right balance of nutrients. There's many different ways of growing. No way is the right way. Um, there's different ways to different people. But it's just to show a different way of growing, and whether it's something you can incorporate into your growing or improve. I've got two other substrates. There's, there's so many out there, but the one I've got here is cocoa and clay pebbles. And the reason why I've just focused on these two is because this year, uh, David and Peter have both been using these substrates. So when you hear from them, you're going to hear about their successes or failures and or how they've done things they've learned about using cocoa and clay pebbles. But the, the key thing with these is they're not pre-fertilized. Um, so when you look at this graph, it, it shows exactly what I was saying before, where potting compost have a certain amount. Um, and the thing with that is you don't always know when that amount of nutrition in the comp potting compost has, uh, has been used up. But also with the storage of potting compost, uh, ones that have been incorrectly stored can break down, so you can have too much nutrient available to the plant too early on. In the middle we've got rock wool. Um, an, an alternative to rock wool could be clay pebbles. So clay pebbles don't have any nutrient in there at all. And then we've got cocoa. Cocoa is on the negative, and the reason being is because cocoa actually absorbs calcium and magnesium from your food. So you have to design a nutrient to, to counter that to get the best out of it. Because many years ago when people were growing with uh, cocoa, when they were first looking into it as a medium for growing, plants would be yellow and would be weak because people didn't understand back then the properties of the cocoa and how best to work with it. So for, for all the growers here, you're all trying to achieve the best you can. You're trying to break new records, you're trying to beat your competitor on the other table, um, and you're looking for a personal best. So you want to make sure that your plants don't want for anything. but in the same way, you don't want to give them too much. Um, so for the professional competitive growers which we have in this room here, it's all about control, about knowing you're not giving too much, you're not giving too less. And how we do that is by EC and pH control when we're using liquid fertilizers. Uh, so I'll just go back one. Um, we've got two tools here. These are two ways that we can actually measure the EC and pH. It's just a very small battery device that you pop in, and it, it, it's your way of control to see what you're doing with your plants. So if I explain the first one, electrical conductivity is a measure of nutrient, um, well, if I say mineral salts, uh, so soluble liquid fertilizers made up of minerals. And our salts conduct electricity and water, so you can make use of this by measuring the conductivity. And then you can correlate that to how much nutrient salts are in your water, or how strong that solution is, to an EC value. Now when we look on here with the concentration of salts, we, we, we don't dose in grams, but we know that when we give a certain, uh, a certain volume or mils, for example, per litre of a liquid fertiliser, that it will bring your EC up, because you're putting more salts in. On a very average approximation, an EC of one equates to one gram of nutrient salts. Now, at the moment, you know, it's not something everybody uses, but it's, all, it's, it's sort of a way of knowing what we're doing and how to control it. But what's important for your plant is the EC it receives. So if, if your root zone in your pot has a very, very salty solution of nutrients, it's not going to be able to get the water it needs. So for example, you know in, in uh, the basement of houses, you, in, where it's very damp, you put a, a pot of salts. The salts attract water to it. The same happens in your root zone, in your plants. If you've got too much nutrient salts down there, then it actually attracts the water and it makes it harder for the plant to get the water. So the EC that the plant receives is very important. And that's made up of two things. It's made up of the EC of your water, because the tap water, if you live in a, a normal water area, has minerals in there. 
and those minerals has an EC value. You add that to what you actually put in, and your EC total, and this, this example is 1.3. And now you can use a, a grow guide or you can build up your own grow guide to understand what your plant needs at different stages and over time you perfect this to get the best out of your plant. So too high REC is bad because the plant can't get the water it needs, the salts are sort of pulling against it. But too low means you don't have any nutrient elements or minerals for your plant to grow healthily and produce uh, the fruit and the leaves and the stems etc. Well, where the control element comes into is if you're providing lunch for your, for your children, for example, you know whether you're giving too much or too little by what's left on the plate or whether they're asking for more. Well, you can do exactly the same thing with your plants. So if you give uh, an EC value of 1.3, which is sort of kind of 1.3 grams of nutrient salts, but you measure in your runoff or you measure in the runoff that you're, oh sorry, in the root zone you measure the EC or you measure the runoff of the liquid coming out of your pots and you find that your EC is 1.1, well, you're putting, in, you're putting in a large amount, but you're measuring less. So this means that your plant is either eating more or evaporating less. So you can, you can counter. So if you're measuring less, it means your, your plant is eating more. So you give more. And in general, we say we, we, don't, we don't increase it by a large amount in one go, we do it gradually, we monitor what's happening. So if we do the opposite, we say, well, we're giving 1.3, but the plant is, we're measuring 1.5 in the root zone or the runoff, it means the plant's not using it all up. So on a table with your children's food, you can see food left on the plate. So in this case, we say, well, we lower, because we don't want nutrients building up in the root zone. When they build up in the root zone, you're gonna have the problem with the plant can't get the water it needs. Now when I say nutrients, I mean minerals, minerals, elements that have a, a, a charge of water. Uh, with your slow-release fertilizers, they, they break down to supply the minerals over time. So that's EC. Any questions so far on this? Cool. Okay, so what is pH? pH is a measure of the amount of acid in water. Now, th this is important because nutrients, nu mineral nutrients are available or they have a absorption ability in water over a certain pH range. So if we just look at water, um, laboratory water or water that's been distilled, it doesn't have anything in it. And it's made up of an equal mixture of um, acid and hydroxide and it's, 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 it's in equilibrium which means it's, it's always the same. But most of us don't, none of us use that water. We use water that comes from the taps and this has been processed in uh, chemical plants. So, in chemical plants. And this water contains uh, carbonates. And the thing that carbonates do, they combine with any acid. So it prevents your water from becoming too acidic or going in either direction. So this is a natural buffer in your water to keep your pH within a certain limit. Now, one of the things that happens in your root zone is the plants are, are well, we could say breathing. They, they're using some of the energy that they use in photosynthesis they're combining it with water and they're producing, so combining it with oxygen and they're producing CO2 and water and they're releasing energy and they use this energy to, for its processes but to also pump the water into the plant. But because it's giving out the CO2, the CO2 will then react with the water in the root zone and it will make the root zone more acidic. So while the plant is taking up certain elements and also while it's just breathing, while it's doing its function, of um, using the energy to pump water into the plant, it's acidifying the root zone. So it, it's constantly changing. Your pH in your root zone is constantly changing. And we're going to see shortly how that affects your growth of your plant. So if we look at the root zone, I'll draw a little diagram here. So we're going to do... Uh, what I've got here is a pH of 4, 5, 6, and 7. And certain elements, when the plant takes it up, uh, will change the, uh, the pH. So can you think of an, uh, an element that the plant takes predominantly in the vegetative phase? Nitrogen. So you have nitrates. And nitrates will make your pH go up. So this is negatively charged elements. Now in the flowering phase, you'll have potassium, for example. Potassium is a positively charged element. 
And now, the uptake of these will, will affect the pH. So for example, if we look at this chart here, so when you're doing with mineral elements or mineral feeds, between the range of 5.2 and uh, let me say 5.2 and 6.2, that is when you've got maximum solvability. That means the plants can absorb those minerals. Now, if your pH goes up, for example, in the vegetative phase, when the plants take in, so if we look at the beginning, of the, we've got the pH on the left-hand side, and then we've got a time period of growth on the, on the bottom. In the beginning, the plant takes mainly nitrogen, and that causes the pH to go up. Now, if the pH continues <coughs> to keep going up too high, what happens is your pH goes up and now some of your minerals that you need are not so available. One of them is uh, phosphate, for example. So if your pH went up to seven, now th th this, in, this, in this example, the amount of phosphate you've got is reduced by 50%. And sometimes what people get with tomato plants, uh, it's very common of cold conditions because in cold conditions, plants can't get the phosphate they need in the same way. But it can also be a result of pH because your pH is going up or it's incorrectly set. So on here, this is a case of nitrogen, so as the plant takes nitrogen, the pH goes up. But then we look at the next one and we look at what happens with um, things like potassium. When a plant takes up potassium, it then makes the pH go down. So your, your pH is always changing in your root zone. And if we go back to the graph, you can see that after a certain period of time here, the plant go, moves into the flowering phase. So for example, if you grow in marrows or onions, although it's not flowering, it's, it's producing the fruit or the bowl. So it takes up more potassium in this case. And when it does that, go back to this graph here, it makes the pH Can I just ask down. a question? Yeah. You're saying about how it changes in that there. Does it also change with the time of day, like um, during the night time to the daytime? So it doesn't matter what time you take to eat it. Ah, yeah. Yes, as a matter of fact, it uh, does because the um, easy um, elements the plant can face will mainly uh, taken at night and will be bounded in an organic structure during the daytime. So, uh, actually, if you look on the inside of the plant, most of the times what we call the luxury elements like potassium is high in the morning. So that means they were taken at night. Then most of the other elements are taking average. And then there is one other element, which is called calcium. And calcium will go with the water flow of the plant. So the more a plant can transpire, the higher the water flow through the plant, and the more calcium it will take. So you have difference indeed for every um, element when it is taken. So general calcium during the day, potassium during the night, nitrogen average in 24 hours. Thank you. Okay, so <coughs> If I come back to this one, and we look at what might happen as in terms of a defi possible deficiency in when you go into the flowering phase if your pH comes down too low. So for example, if we say here, pH has gone all the way down to 4.5 in this case. If we go back to this chart, you can see at 4.5, the amount of all these uh, macro and micro elements is reduced. But manganese, for example, well, it's, <coughs> it's still at maximum. And a typical trait where a plant is going at a, a low pH is where the leaves will become very, very dark, shiny green as a result of the excess of manganese. Eventually, the plant will, uh, the leaves will change color again because the plant is not getting the nutrition it needs, so it starts to strip it out and pull it out the leaves. It's sort of cannibalizing itself. So pH control is, is, is very important and you can often find that it can be the cause of many um, deficiencies. Phosphorus and manganese was an example of uh, too high pH, too low pH, too low pH. So we have different mediums, um, and there's an ideal pH in each one. Um, in, in many soils, the pH is buffered by the lime that you put into it, and it, it does it perfectly. 
in some of the substrates you buy uh, in the bags, which is terra, which is peat, cocoa, aqua, meaning your clay pebbles, we have to control the pH. So, and we do that by setting the pH at a certain level. So for example, in terra, we set the pH at a range of 5.8 to 6.2. Now, because the pH wants to go up in the beginning, when we give our nutrients in a watering can every time we water, we set the pH at the lower end, 5.8, to do the opposite of what it wants to do. It wants to go up as it takes a nitrogen. Towards the end, we then, well, if I come back to this one, it's probably easier to see. <coughs> so in this case here, it wants to go up. So we, we give a pH of 5.5 in the beginning. Later on, we give a pH of 5.8, because we're and later on here, we then give a pH of 6.2 because we want to counter the pH going down. So what we, get, what we give in a watering can is to really keep this pH between 6.2 and 5.2, for example. We're just trying to keep it in that <coughs> perfect area for nutrient uh, absorption. But there is a difference between the mediums. So terra uh, is a very, very acidic, can be a very acidic medium. So to make it stable to growing, we have to put lime. But as you saw with a carbonate, lime will react with acid. So if you give too much acid into uh, a substrate with lime, the acid will eventually deplete all that lime buffer. So to prevent that, we can't give it a too acidic solution. So we set the pH at a minimum of 5.8. Now cocoa, which is a, a new medium to some, um, doesn't have lime in. We don't put lime in there. The, the pH that you give is a pH of what it gets apart from what's happening in the root zone from the uptake of uh, elements. So there's no lime to worry about, so we can give a slightly different pH, a 5.5. We can go a little bit lower. We can't go too low because it's, it's organic. And when you put all acid on organic material, like in jeans, for example, it will create a hole. So in time, it will damage it. Aqua, which I should say, I should rewrite as clay pebbles, for example, it doesn't uh, suffer. So you can now go down to pH 5.2, so you can get the full range um, and then we biocanner. Well, biocanner is, uh, is our organic substrate. So with organic mediums, you don't need pH control because your, your nutritional elements are bound to an organic structure. And the idea is the roots will interact with that and take what it needs over the course. If you then put acid into, well, if you then have too low a pH, which means it's acidic, it breaks up your organic uh, nutrient. When it happens, it turns into uh, a mineral one. So we say with organic, no pH control, unless you've got a very, very high pH or you've got hard water. So you looked at EC and pH, two tools to make sure what I'm giving is the right thing and to monitor what's happening. But then you've also got the nutrients. And there's many, many grow guides out for all the different companies which give you an idea of where to set your EC and where to set your pH. Uh, but as you see uh, from, from growers like Peter and David, who's been using these, this sort of uh, method of growing, in time you work out what works best for your, uh, your, your plant that you're growing in your location, in your country. So you, you kind of get to build up. And the idea with growing in this way is you can try and tailor it to get the best you can. So just before I go on, um, on here it, tells you, it gives you an idea of at a certain EC, a certain pH, how much you give of certain nutrients. So it's a very nice guide to get you started. So it's different nutrients. The terra, the cocoa, the clay pebbles, they all have a certain nutrient designed to work with them perfectly. So we have a one component which is your terra, so that's a single bottle in the vegetative phase, a single in the flower. And then we have a two component bottle for the A and B. I'll, I'll go through this very, very quickly because um, I won't go into more details on this page. So why do you have a, a separate feed for the vegetative phase and the flowering? Well, the plant needs different things at different stages of its growth. So on the left-hand side, we have a chart which shows on the, so this side here, this is the ve vegetative side of growth and this is a flowering. And the blue line is the ideal amount that a plant, a, a particular plant will need of nitrogen. And then the red one is what we try and try and imitate by your grow guide, by what you're giving it. So when you look on the left hand side, you've got the ideal phosphate level. Well, phosphate and potassium are taken, um, they, they, they have a very, very similar curve. Um, so here, 
when you're trying to imitate here with the red line, well, watch out because at some point, if you put in too much, and you can see where the red line, where the curve goes really high, that's because the plant's not taking as much as you're giving. So you start to build up um, more of that in your growing medium. And then you can observe this by checking your EC. And this, when you, when you grow with too much, it can cause all sorts of problems to your plants. Your plants can't get the water they need because the EC is too high. You start to find the leaves are curling. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very good tool, but watch out if you give too much, watch out if you give too little. Um, the second one is you have a, a certain nutrient for each phase. And the, the reason being is because in the vegetative feed, we know that the plant takes up nitrates, and that makes the pH go up. So in this one, we put in the vegetative feed, we also put ammonium. So ammonium is another form of nitrogen, but it's positively charged. So this means that when the plant takes the nitrogen, it stops the pH from going up. So when it takes it as the nitrate form, it helps to bring the pH down as well. But if you continue into the flowering phase, using a vegetative feed, well, in a flowering feed, what happens when it takes potassium? It helps bring the pH down. But if you've also got ammonium in there from a vegetative feed, it comes down even further. And then you get into your uh, area of deficiencies. So that's why we have a second one. Just one question. You're saying about nitrogen being negative, ammonia being positive. Urea, <coughs> what would that be? Uh, positive or negative? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, urea yeah. is um, a nitrogen, yeah. actually neutral. Yeah. It's an organic uh, nitrogen. But that is something a plant cannot take. So first, by microorganisms, it will break it down, mm -hmm. and then one part will become ammonium, and one part will become nitrate. But the balance between those two is exactly one to one, so the balance in pH will stay the same. And that's a big advantage of urea. But this advantage cannot compensate what the potassium is doing. Advance, disadvantage. Cool, thank you. Um, if, for example, when David and Peter were first growing on cocoa, they wanted to know why you have an A bottle and a B bottle. Um, growing on cocoa, for example, cocoa uh, absorbs calcium and magnesium, for example. So we, um, we have to compensate by putting more in. But when you have calcium and phosphate in high concentrations in one bottle, they form gypsum. Gypsum is then insoluble and it drops out and it's no longer available to the plant. So by putting uh, them in separate bottles, we can have a, a, a highly concentrated solution. Yeah, you've got to take two bottles with you, but you go for maximum concentration and better value. Uh, let's see, so the second question Peter and David already know is, well, why do you not have a vegetative feed and a, and a flowering feed? And the reason being is because uh, the, the cocoa uh, substrate is made from cocoa fiber, which is very, very rich in naturally occurring potassium. We didn't put it there. The plant put it there as it was producing the coconut. So what happens with cocoa is it takes calcium and magnesium um, and some nitrogen out of your feed. You compensate by putting more in. But why you don't have a flowering feed is because when it takes in those elements, it then gives out that naturally occurring potassium. So in the beginning, when you have a low EC, when you start, okay, that exchange is, is, is moderate. The higher you increase your EC as you grow, which, which when you see the grow guide, you slowly increase your EC, you build it up as the plant gets bigger, it needs more. So the more you increase the EC over time, the more the exchange. So you actually produce your flowering feed in the cocoa, and there's more than enough potassium in there to, to produce what you need to produce. Um, so that comes to the end of the ECPH. I'm just going to give you a very, very, very quick uh, introduction to the different substrates. So you have terra, which is peat. Now, terra is an easier way to grow. If you give the wrong pH or you give too much nutrients, or you, it will buffer against it. It will take some of it on. If you don't give enough, it will release a little bit out. So it's an easier way to grow. With cocoa. Uh, it absorbs calcium, magnesium, and it releases potassium. That's one of the things it does. 
but it, it also enables you to grow um, at a slightly higher level, you have more control, um, and, you've, and you've got all the, uh, the sort of things about the medium that make it a very good uh, uh, medium for your Ruto. But then you also have Canna, Aqua, which is your clay pebbles, which uh, David's been tinkering with. In this case, what you have in the medium or in the, in the solution, it's a sort of a recirculating system where water is constantly passing by the roots. Everything is available immediately for the plant. So as long as you're given the right EC and pH, the plant gets exactly what it needs. So it's like luxury consumption. There's no buffer in there. And what this means, if you make a mistake, the plant won't do so well. So it's risky, but you can achieve great results with it. So just a summary. Terra, it buffers against uh, disaster. You'll get a nice stable average uh, yield or your personal best, or not a personal best, or a, a, a good harvest, but it prevents against exceptional results. Cocoa, greater yields. Average yield is higher. But when we go to the aqua, the highest yields are possible, but it's risky. If you make a mistake, then you, 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 know, you, you, uh, you risk losing it all. Uh, but you know, people growing giant vegetables, you're, you're sort of make or bust. You're trying to get the best you can do, and uh, this, this is you know a very good way to apply your skills to try and improve it and tinker it. Um, one of the reasons what being is that different substrates hold on to water in different amounts. So terra will hold on to water; it won't release it to the plant as easy as cocoa will. So because cocoa can release water to the plant easier, the plant can now grow better under um, harsher conditions a warmer summer, it can cool itself. With aqua, there's no such thing holding onto the water. So the plant can get exactly what it wants, it can transpire easier, which means you can add extra light in your uh, greenhouses. You can go to CO2, you can complete climate control. So any questions so far?